said, my name is Shine Gates. I've been in Toastmasters for about a year. Uh, I really love it. I feel like my public skills have developed. I do a lot of things where I speak in front of people. I have to speak for the news sometimes. And I feel like this club is very beneficial if that is an area that you may not feel that you have the most um, strength in. So welcome to our visitors. And I hope we get to talk to you afterwards and learn about you and what brought you here today. So with that, we will explain our as he explained, we have three sections to our meeting, and we will have each person break down their role, just so our guests uh, kind of know what's going on and they're not confused. So, can I get the timer to explain their role? Hey, uh, I'm up to the market. That will be the, the timer for tonight. So, my role is to uh, make sure uh, that we have uh, the speeches in the alignment of the allotted uh, uh, duration of time. The prepared speeches, which is the first section, as just as was, as was just mentioned, they range from five to seven, five minutes being green, and then when it goes five to six, it goes in yellow. That's it's about time when we try to uh, wind up our feet or uh, get to the final part and uh, seven is when it goes red so it's uh, recommended that we try to uh, finish the speech and uh, make the important point uh, in the conclusion so that's the first part the second part is uh, the table topics the table topics speeches uh, once the question is asked you have a minute uh, where it's a healthy range for answering a table topic question. Uh, one minute to two minutes is a good range, uh, which is yellow, one to two, and above two is uh, you try to wind up your table topic answer, uh, which goes in red. So it's an indication for you uh, with this slide. And uh, the last part is the evaluation. Uh, when the prepared speech is evaluated by the evaluator, and that ranges from two to three minutes. Two minutes being green and two to three is yellow. It's when you try to wind up your evaluation and above three is red. So to try to wind up uh, right after three, which uh, would be indicated by a red. Back to this master. All right, thank you, Jim. And can I please hear from our author and grammarian? All right, I'm the grammarian and also the author. Can we ask you to be all counted? Yes, sir. Thank you. I just didn't want to steal this from someone else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. So my name is Kyler. I'll be the all counter grammarian. Uh, for my role as all counter, I will listen to filler words such as um, like, so, you know, any word that you would use to fill in a blank space uh, when you feel uncomfortable. And then, which the goal is to just kind of be more streamlined than what we're talking about up, up, up on the up on pulpit. So the next part I will do is the grammarian. Um, and I'll look for abuse of the English language, things that don't sound right, things that are grammatically incorrect. And I'll also present the word of the day, which is fat, which is a pretty fun word. Um, it is British slang, and it is a overcomplicated task, especially one perceived as a waste of time. Um, an example is adjusting this television is a bit of faff. Um, another way to use it is a stage of confusion or frantic activity. Um, she's in a total fat about tonight's dinner. Um, some other, it can also be used as a verb, so it's a pretty interesting word that it can be a noun and a verb. Uh, it can be used in the, you could use it as uh, someone who's faffing around. or someone faffed about, I decided to stop faffing and get some work done. Do we have to use a British accent? You can, you'll get both. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and that's it for my rules committee. Thank you. Uh, next, can we hear from the general evaluator? Hi, everyone. I'm Diego. I'm the general evaluator for tonight. And my primary role is to welcome to the lectern the evaluators of the prepared speeches because it is not only is it important for you to step up to the lectern and shoot your best shot at delivering the speech. It's also important for you to hear feedback from the audience members who are listening and trying to be aware of 
what good habits you're exercising when it comes to delivering your speech, as well as what bad habits you should look to work on minimizing or eliminating in the future speeches that you give. That is the primary responsibility of the general evaluator. Thank you, Diego. And last but not least, I will also be doing the table topics which will happen after the prepared speeches. We have a list of questions, and you either get the question beforehand or after you volunteer, and you come up and try to speak for at least one minute. Uh, two minutes. One to two. One to two, sorry. One minute uh, is the green for that. Um, about anything, if you're new, we'd love to hear from you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, but no pressure. But if you want to, we greatly encourage it. So. With that, I will uh, introduce our first speaker. And we have Diego coming up. He always gives great speeches and looking forward to see what a story time about morality and desperate times. My fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, Growing up, what the storytelling medium that spoke the most to me as a little as a young man and still kind of today was actually video games. And specifically video games that made me learn more about the human condition and how morality is a very can be very fickle based on the situations that you find yourself in. And one particular story that I want to share with you all about involves a video game that tells choices and stories about civilians who are caught in a civil war conflict. And they are non-combatants and clearly not trained whatsoever in the combatant lifestyle or what to expect when it comes to civil war. To set the scene, I'm controlling a person named Marco who is a very skilled scavenger who at night goes out and collects supplies like food, water, and equipment for the makeshift shelter back home. And he is responsible for two women, one of who is pregnant. So I and Marco decide that it's time to scavenge and look for supplies in an abandoned apartment. And once we make it into the building, we can hear muffled voices in a particular room of the apartment complex. And based on previous encounters we've had with other people that we don't know about that were, are strangers to us in other conflicts and on other night times, we decide that it's best for us to stay as far away from that room as possible because we don't know what intentions they have whatsoever, whether they're friendly or foe. So Marco and I proceed to pilfer throughout the rest of the apartment complex but we find out that the way that the, uh, the building is set up, if we want to get to other parts of the building and other parts of the room, we're going to have to risk meeting these people in order to traverse across the room and hopefully have access to better goods on the other side of the apartment complex. So after much deliberation and much careful steps and footsteps, we actually managed to see through the keyhole a young man with two young women who are opening the drawers of the kitchen looking for supplies. And finally, because we're running out of time and daylight is approaching, we finally open the door and we encounter these three individuals. Fortunately for us, they are non-combatants and they don't want any trouble with us either. And they explain that they just want equipment for their parents who are sick and also very vulnerable in this time of need. And me and Marco explained that, again, we don't want any trouble either. We are sure that there's plenty of equipment and supplies for everyone to share. We don't need to go to blows about this. And so we cross to the other side of the apartment, and we can hear a, a rustling of the lockpicks and keys. And as we approach closer to this key and this lock being picked at, we see through the keyhole two very burly men who are armed and ready, ready for, a, for a fight. And we can hear that they're ready to assault the apartment complex and take out this family. And me and Marco, we, we decide immediately at first that we need to inform this family of what's about to happen, that there's going to be a scuffle and we need to protect them. But there's another part of me 
that recognizes the opportunity of hiding in the apartment complex out of view of these men and not letting the family members know of what's about to transpire. And we can scavenge the supplies after the fact of whatever consequences, whatever events transpire. What feels like 30 minutes of de deliberation has to be boiled down to five seconds because the pick is being opened as we think about what, what we need to do. But we decide as a team that the right thing to do is to inform these family members of what's about to happen and we need to prepare for this fight that's about to happen. So we return to the family and let them know that these men are coming to attack. And as we prepare for, for battle, the, the jostling of the lockpick finally ends. And now we can start hearing the footsteps of these men approaching the, the room that we're in. And just as the door's about to open, again, the very infectious thought that I have of leaving these family members to fend for themselves and to pick up the scraps of, of whatever the scuffle ends up being, it infects my brain again. But again, I power through and I decide, no, the right thing to do is to stay with these family members and, and help them survive this battle. So before I know it, the door slams open and the men are coming to blows, the women are doing what they can, and in all this confusion and fiasco, I lose track of who's friend and who's foe, and me and Mark, we decide to attack the first man that we see. But immediately, the man is, 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 is beaten back, but immediately the women start attacking us, and in this confusion, we have no idea what's going on. Suddenly, we become enemies as well, and those five minutes of being exasperated and confused is much too long. And before long, Marco is dead on the floor. And I managed to escape with, uh, with my dignity intact somewhat, but no, with no supplies whatsoever. And in that moment, this video game really was really frustrating for me. In, in that moment, I thought about resetting the game because there's no way I can recover from this loss. I've lost a very important scavenger with who, a very great talent with me, and I've lost the supplies that I set out to collect for everyone for the night. But I think that video game really showed me an important life lesson about, about life and about being prepared and always being on your guard when it comes to moments of uncertainty and confusion. And I actually decided to continue playing through the video game, but that was a what happened after the fact was really not the important thing. What was more important about this video game was showing me that never let, let go of your guard because things can go to hell in a handbasket at any moment and you need to be prepared for that. But I think the other more important thing that this video game showed me was really how, and it was very astonishing to me, how quickly the idea of forsaking this family and leaving them to grips to fight, fend for themselves against, this family, against these armed thugs how quickly that idea embedded itself in my brain of taking on my own self-interest at the expense of others. And how, you know, in moments of desperation and vulnerability and uncertainty, how quickly we're willing to let go of our morals sometimes if it means our own self-interest and our own self-preservation. And I really think that was an important lesson that I learned from this brief story moment that I had in this video game, among other experiences I've had in this video game. And I, I want to thank you all for your attention and listening to the story that I had to share with you all. Thank you. Well, we learned who not to partner with if the end times come, as Diego will leave you behind. I'm just kidding. I probably would too. So. <laughs> um, so thank you for that speech. Uh, we have two prepared speeches today, which is a treat because we usually only have one. So I'd like to welcome our next speaker, David Roberts, with his speech here. Careful, careful, a user's guide to our injury-prone minds. I'd like to look around at our local libraries, check out the latest books, 
And when I found this book, I was excited because my gut instinct has always been that at times in my life, I do things that aren't particularly safe, perhaps. Whether it's a home improvement project where I'm higher up on the ladder than I'm supposed to be, using a screwdriver as a pry bar, or even just running late trying to get to a Toastmasters meeting, and maybe I'm hoping I make that next light. And there's times where I could be more safe. And this book has a wealth of knowledge, I found. 100 years ago, only 100 years ago, the average life expectancy in the United States was 52, 52 years old. I'm 55. That means 100 years ago, the average person my age would already be dead. So why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. A lot of things have changed in the last 100 years, but one of the biggest is a reduction in preventable injuries and deaths and accidents. There's been organizations like OSHA that helps keep us safe in the workplace. And there's been all kinds of safety interventions that our ancestors couldn't have even dreamed of. Automobiles are a good example. There's safety technology in automobiles now with airbags and crumple zones and collapsible steering columns that were just unthought of not too long ago. So if you put it on a chart, if you if you made a chart, you would find that decade by decade, the injury rate, the accidental death rate has gone down in this country until, and this is the bad news, until 1992. Around 1992, there was a plateau. And since then, the accidental death rate in this country has been on the rise. So why is this? With all the external things we have keeping us safe, it turns out our own internal behaviors are starting to kill us. There's three points I'd like to talk about. This book has much information in it, but there's not a lot of time. The first is, can anyone guess what the most deadliest thing I own is now, currently? Car's a good guess. Maybe I've got guns at home. The most dangerous thing, in, that I own right now is this, my cell phone. And the reason for that is, the first item I'm talking about is paying attention. Cell phones demand my attention. It demands our attention. It tries to steal our attention from us. How many times have you seen, you your, see somebody crossing a busy highway and they're doing this? They may look up a minute and then they're back down doing this. Or even worse, how many times have you seen someone driving down a highway and they got their phone in their hand trying to read it while they're going? It turns out that human beings, we are terrible multitaskers. We cannot do two things at the same time. And even worse than that, when we try to do more than one thing at a time and we switch from one task to another, there's what's called a hangover effect. It takes our brains a little bit of time to reorient in what we're doing. It feels like we're doing two things at once, but we're really not, or we're doing them both horribly. So distractions are killing us. The cell phone is just the best example, but that's just an area in this more and more complicated world where, where we need to pay better attention. The next thing I was going to talk about is thinking ahead. When I turned 40 years old, I bought my very first motorcycle. And being a reasonable person, I thought, you know, I've never ridden a motorcycle before, so I probably should take a safety class on it. So I took a weekend long safety school on motorcycling. And there, I thought, we had one day of classroom and one day actually riding motorcycles in this big parking lot. I thought the day on the motorcycle would be the most useful. That's where I would learn the most. But it turns out that the classroom was really the more beneficial thing for me. And, and that's another good example of thinking ahead. I'm buying a motorcycle, but I'm thinking ahead. I need to do something to keep myself safe on it. And, but in the classroom, the, one of the instructors taught us that accidents don't just happen, or it's very rare that an accident just happens. 
usually an accident, there is a chain of events that happen. And if we are looking ahead, not just in our immediate area, but looking down the road five or six seconds from where we're going to be, and look at what's going on, we will find that oftentimes we will see the chain of events that's happening. And if we can just break one link in that chain, we can prevent ourselves from being in a position of being in an accident. And I really attribute that one thought to keeping me safe. I, I commuted to work in rush hour traffic in this city for eight years on a motorcycle and never had a single incident. And that brings me to my third and final point, receiving advice. You probably didn't see that coming, receiving advice. What does that have to do with, with being safe or being careful? Well, we hate being told what to do. People hate getting advice. And when I went to that school, I was 40 years old. I've been driving a car for 25 years. I was older than the instructor. So when he started talking about how to not have an accident when you're on the roadway, it would have been easy for me to think, you know, I know how to drive a car. What? I know how to not have an accident. I, I want to learn how to ride motorcycles. But instead, I was able to swallow my pride and think, you know, maybe this person has something to teach me. And it's a very difficult thing to do to receive advice from people that may have more experience than us. And 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 if it had just been a lay person, if Carrie had told me, you know, David, to be a safer driver, you should do this and this, you know, I would probably think. You know, I drive just fine. Just go about your business. But, but being humble and listening to what people have to say can make a difference. So I've talked about paying attention, thinking ahead, and just being willing to receive advice. So I'll leave you with this. Um, life isn't a video game. When I was a child, I loved to play video games. And usually my one quarter would buy me three lives. But in real life, we only have our own one life. So please be careful, Mr. Tesman. The little bit older I get, the more I start thinking about all the surrounding dangers that I may not have thought about when I was younger. Because you're invincible if you're told your mid 20s, and you're like, oh. That hurts more than it used to. So, with that, we will transition into our table topics. I will not do a division like turn because I am also the table topics master. So, enough tapping around and let's get to the fun part. All right, I'm going to let someone volunteer and then read you your question. All right, Diego. Let's see. Gotta get it extra difficult one for you. Okay. I'm just kidding. Uh, which one of your responsibilities do you wish you could get rid of? Thank you, Cheyenne, so much for giving me a great question for me to apply the word faff. <laughs> so if I could faff around all day with one less responsibility in my life, so I could engage in more faffitude. <laughs> I think the most aggravating responsibility that I regularly find myself doing is washing dishes. I think the most aggravating thing about washing dishes is all the grime and yucky stuff that you find, leftovers on a plate, and all that and especially when you're someone like me who's a chemist who knows actually who has a bit of an idea what those compounds are. It really doesn't sit well knowing that all that all those chemicals are touching my hands and, I, and for some part of me really doesn't also thinks that the soap isn't doing enough of a job to, to wash my hands clean there's still that really greasy smell on my fingertips and yeah all that knowing that all that, that all that unhealthy residue is left over on those plates and I have to deal with it that's really that really grinds my gears and makes me want to vomit sometimes and kind of leave an even worse mess at the dish at the dishwashing station than what I set up to do. So if I could if I could faff more regularly by avoiding dishwashing responsibilities, I think it'd be much better life for me. 
I'll relinquish the lectern back to you. hard about this, but um, one, uh, one thing I wish I had done when I was younger is uh, learn to play the piano and learn music theory, because now I'm interested in music, and now I want to like learn how to play different instruments, but I faffed around as a kid, and now I don't have a, a basis of knowledge for that, that language. Um, however, now as an adult, I'm much more organized, and I'm teaching myself, and I'm slowly figuring it out. But I just have this like distinct memory as a kid where they're like, you want to learn how to play the piano? And I was like, nah, I can already play the piano. And I just did like two notes repeatedly and was like done with it. So if I, yeah, the opportunity I think I missed out on as a kid is taking piano lessons. Thank you. Yeah, playing chopsticks does not count as playing the piano. Yeah, I was like, oh, I'm good. Uh, I'm good. We're good. <laughs> Without. Not people. Possession. Hello, everyone. So the question asked is, what's one, uh, what's one possession that you cannot live without? The first thing that comes to my mind here in Mobile with poor transportation is uh, your car. I would think that's the first uh, uh, position that you need to survive here in Mobile. Like when I landed here back in 2006, uh, I started to look around to the university. I was very close to where, I lived very close to the university. But again, when you want to move out, go to, say, grocery place, then you are stuck or you want to work somewhere. Uh, but as we have very limited transportation facility in Mobile, I think uh, that was my first uh, buy in my life that I used my money to buy, is a 1991 Nissan Sentra <laughs> that helped me go point A to point B. That's uh, a big achievement for me. So I would think uh, at this point of time, the necessities have been changed, uh, the priorities. But for me, I think the first thing um, that comes to my mind very important um, as a thing, not as an individual person, as the question was asked, is uh, transportation and uh, car. Thank you. Mobile is trying to be walkable, but not yet. So, we have time for one more. I'll give it a shot. Okay. Would you like to tell us about yourself, or would you like to try a question? Uh, I can just talk, uh, I guess. You can just tell us your name, how you found out about Sounds good. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Bill Kitchen. Uh, I am 39 years old uh, later this month. Let's see, about myself, I've been here in Mobile uh, for about a year. I moved down here for work. Uh, my family lives in another, another state. I work here and I fly back and forth uh, once a month. Uh, I've driven back a time or two uh, longer weekends uh, to visit with the family. I like to, uh, you know, kind of join Toastmasters because I know I have some kind of apprehension when I'm, when I'm standing up in particular in front of people. Uh, generally, if I'm at a tabletop uh, and everybody's sitting down, for some reason it's not an issue, uh, but for some reason when I'm standing up, I noticed this when I went through school, uh, it's, it's been an issue, and I haven't noticed in the past. I was in the Navy uh, for 12 and a half years, and I was a training officer and I had a lot of collateral duties, and I addressed large crowds of people, and for some reason it wasn't an issue. And I got out of the Navy in 2013, I went to school, um, and I noticed this 
pretty quickly uh, standing up, giving presentations uh, that I have, I have some issues uh, I need to work on. And my current job that I'm here for, funny enough, uh, piggybacking off of David's uh, speech is I work in safety. I work for OSHA. Uh, I'm an OSHA compliance officer, specifically an uh, industrial hygienist. Uh, does anybody know what an industrial hygienist does? So a lot of people think uh, dental hygienist, uh, <laughs> or they think it's just another fancy word for a janitor. But essentially what I do is I monitor, I measure the amount of ex exposure employees are getting to chemical vapors, uh, heavy metal particulates, noise, uh, radiation, heat, uh, stuff like that. And then based on uh, my measurements, I, I kind of tell the employer what their responsibility is to protect that employee uh, and they don't really have a choice but to do what I tell them to. I mean, I guess they do. Uh, it just doesn't work out well for them. <laughs> um, yep, so, uh, so I've been here a year and uh, I hope that kind of exposing myself to standing up in front of people uh, will kind of get my body used to the jitters uh, as, as I often address, you know, large groups of corporate people. Most of the time I'm sitting down at a table. Uh, but I could potentially uh, do give larger presentations. So thanks, everybody. Well, you seem like you're a natural. You seem like yeah. Thank you for visiting. All right. Me and Jerk. Yeah, I'm trying to stay in my lane. So um, with that, that concludes our table topics. And we will go into our next portion, which is our evaluations. So I will turn it over to our general evaluator. Thank you, Shane. it's clear that you're getting the hang of Toastmasters. I'm, I'm concerned why you why I still think you're not. You're, I'm concerned why you were hesitant to do it in the first place because I, I think you're. I think it's becoming muscle memory for you now, which is great. Really great sign of growth. Okay, so the general evaluator. I'll give my two cents after we hear from the first evaluator and the second evaluator, and then I'll give my, my time to evaluation so that way the timer can do his responsibility, and then we'll go over the different role reports from everyone. So let's please give a warm round of applause to Maurice, who was kind enough to evaluate my prepared speech. to evaluate the Eagle speech, story time about morality and desperate times. On the general comments, he excelled at presenting a dramatic story about a video game pertaining to civil war and, and your character who's affected by the war and you managed to escape and, why, and your friend didn't. What you may want to work on is vocal variety. Even though you had a lot of sound effect variety, just I think you work generally on vocal variety. It's a challenge yourself, continue to produce creative speeches and add more vocal variety. Now to the evaluation form. Clarity, your speaking voice was loud and clear. Vocal variety, again, showed a little vocal variety, but plenty of sound effect variety, so that kind of make, made up for your lack of vocal variety. Eye contact, you had a, moder a moderate amount of eye contact with the audience. Gestures, display gestures that complemented the speech. Audience awareness, the speaker was aware of the audience's response or reactions to the speech. Comfort level, the speaker was very comfortable with the audience. Interest, the audience appeared very interested in the speech. Impact, the story was very impactful. And pace, he spoke at a medium to quick pace. Again, it was a, a good, impactful speech and dramatic speech overall. And just work on those few points during your next speech. Madam, thank you very much.
Thank you, Maurice, for the good feedback and suggestions on how to do a better job with storytelling in the future. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming up to the lectern next is Carrie, who did the next, who we're looking forward to hearing her evaluation on David's well presented speech. Let's give her a round of applause. Good evening, Toastmasters, guests, and the members. And nice to meet you, for our first people, first time here. And tonight, my mind was very was fucked around. So it was, it's very good to do this because my mind's not focused, calm, and peaceful. So let me talk about uh, the David's back evaluation. First of all, excellent part. I like the topic so that we all can use his information. Result, everybody really focus and more pay attention to his speech. I really like it. And the second excellent part is clarity. It's really his speak, of course his voice, but also well organized. First, second, third, and organ organized, well organized. So it's very clarity. And some parts that he need to work on. First, vocal variety. What I mean is his voice really loud enough. Sometimes fast, sometimes slow. I like it. But it's good to have more tone. Sometimes loud, sometimes small, sometimes little silly voice. Sometimes serious voice. And I like to have more uh, variety of voice, vocal variety. The last one is the challenge. He needs to challenge on his eye contact. Much better than before. Not just focus on mute while he's talking, more looking around, looking around, but it's more looking around wider means just not right there, also right here, and also right here, or sometimes right here, or sometimes right there. Again, it's more variation of the, uh, his eye contact, wide range. And then one more thing is his gesture. He tried to use his gesture, that is great. But one thing I like to point it out when he talk about the uh, the graph, he's trying to showing the accident rate is declining, declining from his viewpoint. So, but audience viewpoint, it look like an up, 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 up because we usually start with a right to left. So from your viewpoint, right here, and if he used that his audience viewpoint, that would be really excellent. These are what I'd like to evaluate and this uh, share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carrie. Okay, oh, I have that. Okay. All right, now I, I will like to share with you all my general comments of tonight's meeting. We were successful in building the agenda around around the starting time, but again, what really helps with making sure the agenda is packed and complete is by people going on to easy speak and volunteering for important roles that help make the meetings happen. That is, that is important feedback that I want to share with everyone. I, th I think I'm very thankful that again, the calendar method that we're using is really making people, holding them accountable for preparing a speech, working on it, and then being ready to present, so that's very good. I'm very, it's very good to see that this calendar method that we're using is making sure that people are stepping up to the plate and using those prepared speeches opportunities to grow as a public speaker and get used to having the spotlight on them, so that's very good to see. I feel those are really the main comments that I want to share with everyone tonight about, again, using Easy Speak to sign up for roles and it's good that everyone's using the calendar method and committing to the prepared speeches opportunities. Okay, now my now with my general comments over, let's hear from the different roles from tonight. Let's hear from Kyler's report on the out counter and the grammarian keys. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so for my out counter report, we did pretty well. Um, most people did not have. Uh, um, filler words, but the people who did, there were very few. Cheyenne had two, Diego had one, and uh, I have one, although I'm adding to my count as I go. The, uh, 
Bill, I gave you a break on the off-counter since it's your first time uh, being here, but normally we listen for like filler words if you say home. Um, uh, if you know, we'll make a tip just to keep track of them, to like learn to let those words go. Uh, so, which like I said, I can't judge anyone on that because I'm the king. So, the word of the day was faff, and Cheyenne used it, Diego used it uh, four times. Um, I used it once. Uh, I think, let's see who else, and then Carrie used it. So, and that's it. But then, no, I didn't hear any use of the English language or any uh, incorrect grammar. Excellent. Thanks, Pilot. Majid, would you share with us the timers report? Sure. Uh, the time of the report, we had a uh, nice organized speeches. The first one, uh, more, much encouraging one uh, from Diego was 7 minutes 42 seconds. Again, a motivational speech by David. This good uh, seven minutes and uh, 40 seconds. And the table topic, Diego, had uh, one minute and, and 22, uh, six, 26 seconds. The second table topic was uh, from Tyler, which was 46 seconds. Third one was me, uh, one minute and 18 seconds. The fourth one, Bill it was a good uh, overview. Uh, thanks, Bill, for the overview of uh, and a good introduction. Um, I didn't count it, uh, but it was uh, well uh, around two minutes. About the general evaluation, Morris was the first evaluator. Uh, the evaluation was one minute and 43 seconds. And the second evaluation, uh, Gallery is uh, 2 minutes and 32 seconds. With this now, let's continue. Thank you, Majid. I think we've heard from all the important roles from tonight. Thank you, thank you, Kyler and Majid, for taking on a, a big responsibility of doing this important evaluation portion of our meeting tonight. And I will relinquish the lectern back to our Toastmaster, Cheyenne. involves one of the six different moments of truth that officers and, and members of Toastmasters volunteer their time to think about, about improving the Toastmasters experience for a specific club. And my So a moment of truth is a particular aspect of the Toastmasters experience and it's an opportunity for a member to reflect on what great habits, what, what great things are we doing to make the Toastmasters experience as welcoming and appealing as possible, and what what areas of improvement there are in order to make sure that this club is appealing to as many people as possible, while still encouraging growth and leadership and moments of uncomfortability among members. So my particular moment of truth is first impressions. And it basically boils down to making sure that guests have positive experiences and observations that will encourage them to return and become members. So there are six standards that I was asked to evaluate on. There was guests are greeted warmly and introduced to officers and members. The guest book and name tags are provided. Professionally arranged meeting room. A convenient meeting location. Guests are invited to address the club, and then finally guests are invited to join. So I want to go ahead and go over the, the a, f a few of the things that clearly we're doing really well at, so we can get to the areas of improvement. So on a scale of one to five, the guests invited to join, we are always meeting that standard. We are always making sure to inform guests about what is the membership dues like, what, is, what benefits do you gain from joining Hilltoppers Toastmasters, among other things. So we're doing a really great job of informing our guests about that. One other, one area of improvement is the guests invited to address the club. And actually, it's too bad Cheyenne stepped out of the room. I wanted to praise her for what she did tonight. 
but I think it was really great that Cheyenne set aside some time from the table topics portion to invite Bill to come up forward and share a little bit about about who he is and what, what made him want to join Toastmasters. And I think that is a good habit that we haven't done in the past, but I, and I think it's something that going forward is something that we should practice on a regular basis to let members, to let guests come forward and share a little bit about themselves to help break the ice and so we can learn more about what they're looking for in Toastmasters and how what we as members can do to make sure that those expectations and needs are being met. I think we're also doing a good job of warmly greeting guests and introducing officers and members. I think that's a really great, I think that's probably one of the most important criteria that we need to have as a, as a club because that is probably the biggest first impression that any guest will have. We need to make sure that, our, that we members create an, envi an environment, an atmosphere of learning and welcome and friendliness so that way guests know that although we want to build great leaders out of them, we're not looking to, we're not looking to belittle them or make them feel personally attacked for their courage to step up forward to the lecture and become vulnerable for a moment. So I think we're really I think that's a very important skill that we're exercising on a regular basis. The guest book and the name tags being provided, I marked that as a four. I think it's good that we're providing guest books, but I think what I want to work on at the next meeting is printing out name tags or table tents for regular members so that way people can visually see who's who's the table topics master, who's the odd counter, and people recognize people's names and, and they don't, and if they forget the name for a moment, they don't have to awkwardly ask, oh uh, what's your name again? They can just see, oh David Roberts. The one other just one other quick comments I want to share. For a professionally arranged meeting room, I marked it as a three. I feel that it's become a little bit of a habit that we kind of scramble at the last minute to, to set up the lectern, to put the notebook on the table, or to set up a projector screen. I think that's something that going forward we need to work on. And then finally, the convenient meeting location, I marked it as a four. I think I think it might be confusing for guests to hear that first of all, Carpe Diem is an upstairs room. Usually, they just know about the ground floor. So what I was going to suggest going forward was Maybe we could assign one, once per week a uh, member to be on the first floor and be attentive for potential guests who say, oh, I'm here for the Toastmaster meeting, and we, that guest, the, the member can then guide the guest up to the upstairs room to help facilitate people finding out the location in the right manner. So I think first impressions wise, I think we're doing a great job. There's good areas of improvement that we can work on as a team, and I will relinquish the lectern back to the acting president, which is me. Okay, we do not have any awards tonight, I believe. And I, let's see what time it is when we're, when we're approaching. Oh good, we have, we have some time. Do we have any volunteers? So next week, let's see what the calendar says. Next week we have... Uh, me and Sean. Sean and Maurice are stepping up to do prepared speeches. Thank you. Do we have any volunteers for being evaluators for these people? Okay. Do we have volunteers for being Toastmasters next week? I could be an evaluator. Yeah, I could be an evaluator. Thanks, Kyler. And David? Okay. David, I will have you evaluate Maurice, and Kyler, I will have you evaluate Sean. Majid, are you going to be here next week? Yeah. I want to suggest, would you like to try being Toastmaster next week? I don't think you've tried being Toastmaster yet. I've done it once, but very poorly, but I can try. I have a cheat. I have a cheat. Okay. Would you like to do it again? Yeah. Okay. Great. Because the only way you get better is by doing it multiple times. Sure. If Joe were here, he's my mentee, I would have asked him to do Toastmasters next week. But I'll, I'll, I'll message him another time. I'll find out when he come, he'll, he'll come in next time. Do we have volunteers for general evaluator, off counter, timer, grammarian? Carrie, would you mind being timer next week? I'm not sure I would be here. Oh, okay. 
That's good. Right. I can be a general evaluator the next week. Um, if you're still a guest, right? You're still not a member? Okay. Then, then I can't volunteer you for a role. Okay, since all the members tonight have been able to sign up for a role, then we then I will go through Easy Speak online and then see who can fill the roles for next week. Is there any other pressing business that I think needs to be shared? I can't think of any. No. Okay, just again, be on the lookout for your emails. I believe Justin will be sending through Venmo the invoices for club dues. Yeah. So just be attentive for that in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll work on the Toastmasters Leadership Institute meeting, and I will probably send an email in the future about the upcoming open house. So with that, thank you all for coming tonight and looking forward to seeing you all at next week's meeting. Thank you.